Hi, welcome everybody. From all around the world, we've got people joining us today for the latest in our events of the University of York's York Alumni Association Professional Networking event. Today, I'm in my caravan. I don't know where you are around the world, but it's very strange circumstances for all of us, but we're so delighted that we could bring so many of our alumni friends and colleagues together. Um, in a moment, it will be my privilege to introduce our chair for today's event. But in the meantime, there's just two or three housekeeping um, matters which I need to share with you. First of all, to let you know that your camera and your microphone will remain off. Um, questions will be via the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, not via chat. So please use the Q&A if at all possible. The session is being recorded. Um, and this is so that we can promote it more widely to our alumni after the event and that more people can enjoy the questions um, that you have asked. The next event in our series will be on Thursday, the 10th of December at one o'clock and that's on Enterprise. So do look out for your invitation for that one and please do join us if you're able. Um, finally, just before I introduce our chair, to let you know, of course, today's event is uh, free to attend. And we're grateful to everybody who has given their time to make this event possible, particularly to our chair and to our panellists. If you would like to make a donation to the York Opportunity Scholarship, you will find details of how to do that, um, both in your event invitation and in the follow up evaluation, which we'll be sending you after the event. So without further ado, um, please may I introduce Professor Sarah Thompson, MBE. Sarah, would you like to unmute and hide your, unhide your screen? I think everybody in our panel is going to do that now. Yes, I have done. Great, lovely. So Sarah is our Associate Dean of Research in the Faculty of Sciences at the University of York, having previously been Head of Physics at the University from 2011 to 2017. And her primary research interests are thin film magnetic materials and nanothermal imaging. So without further ado, Sarah, may I pass over to you? Thank you very much, Kyla, and welcome everybody um, to this webinar. Um, it really is my, my pleasure and I can welcome you to York, even though nobody's in York, but welcome you virtually. Um, I'm one of your panelists as well as being the chair of the event. So um, forgive me if I actually answer a few questions as well as hopefully curating many, many questions that you're going to um, throw at us. And we're, we're up for trying to answer anything that you um, that you that you want to uh, want to ask us. The only thing I would just want to really briefly add to the introduction is it's often a difficult question when people say to me what's your career path because it's university then York and that's sort of it but then when you unpick an academic career you find so many different things in there from working um, for a huge variety of industries, working in many different countries, actually enjoying teaching and perhaps surprisingly enjoying the management side of, um, of working in a university as well. So I'm up to answer lots of questions and looking forward to receiving them from you. But first of all, um, we have a, a, a really interesting panel, um, which I'd like now to introduce to you and they're going to say each of them is going to say a few words um, about themselves. So um, the first panelist is Dr. Anna McIntosh, who's the program manager for our Assuring Autonomy International program here at the, the University of York. Um, this is a really major sort of 12 million pound uh, program, um, which Anna has a lot of responsibility for, but I'm going to let her say a few words um, about herself. So over to you, Anna. Thanks very much, Sarah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Anna McIntosh, and uh, as Sarah's already said, I manage the Assuring Autonomy International Programme. So this is a programme looking at the safety of robotics and autonomous systems. We're interested in understanding how we can make these technologies safe so that they can be adopted by countries across the world um, in a safe manner. Um, but I haven't always been working in robotics. So actually, I started off being a materials engineer uh, many years ago uh, before moving on to working with a number of universities across the, the UK um, after my PhD in tissue engineering. So that's at the junction between biology, medicine uh, and engineering itself. Um, and from there, I've taken a, a slightly 
sinuous path to end up here in the University of York um, looking at robotics. Um, my role is somewhere in between a technical translator, so understanding what's going on in the research uh, and manager. So it's really at that interface. Without the uh, scientific and engineering background, uh, I wouldn't be able to do my job. And yet it's not really what I do in my day to day. That's it for me. Excellent, thank you. And our next uh, panelist is Bolajoko uh, Akin Falarin, um, who has a degree in electronics and communications uh, engineering. And she's a, the deployment sites acquisition manager at IHS Towers in, in Nigeria, which is one of the largest telecoms infrastructure companies in the Middle East uh, and Africa. So um, that's quite a role. And I'm gonna hand over to uh, Bolajoko to tell us just a little bit more. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I graduated in York studying electronics and communications in 2014, I believe. I then went on to UCL to do my master's in wireless and optical communications. Yeah, I have a thing for communications. And I did a bit of research project with Arcotel um, in 2015 before I moved back to Nigeria and I decided to join the telecom sector and I've always been a major fan of telecommunications either through the wireless bit or the optical bit so I joined IHS and I moved from the active part of telecommunications to the passive part of communication so now I am responsible for heading the unit of site acquisition which is basically making sure that all the technical requirements are being met in the location that we're going to be building the towers in and yeah that's pretty much it thank you thank you Bolajoko. and then uh well just before i say and finally um you've got the time while grace is speaking to start asking questions because i've got a very blank sheet in front of me so please start uh, start typing um, in the meantime, Grace, uh, Physics with Astrophysics, um, and she's currently a program manager um, for Microsoft and Microsoft's identity uh, division. So tell us just a little bit more about that, Grace. Hi, thanks, Sarah. Yeah, so I graduated from University of York in 2012, the degree in, with uh, physics, with astrophysics. I then um, decided that I didn't really know what I wanted to do <laughs> as much as I'd enjoyed my my degree, I thought, you know, I would quite like to go to space, but let's uh, see what else is out there. So um, I actually took some time and worked at the Olympics and the Paralympics, leading um, a few teams there working for Adidas. Um, I then did some traffic, traveling, uh, pretty classic. And then I decided it was time to get a graduate job. Um, and I actually ended up were going into IT consultancy as a project manager. So for many years, I worked doing digital transformation as a consultant, and I found myself becoming more and more um, of a, an SME within the digital transformation space, particularly in cloud computing. Um, after about five or six years consulting, um, I realized you know, I did kind of want to be more of an SME. And I got the tap on the shoulder from Microsoft uh, as an opportunity to join engineer, uh, to be a field engineer. Then after a few years, I joined engineering. So now I'm a program manager within our cloud and AI team, specifically working in identity. So we um, build, manage, support um, our identity products for authentication and authorization across consumer enterprise and gaming. So specifically, I work in enterprise. So I work with our large, complex global organizations to make sure that the identity products that we're building for them, specifically Azure Active Directory, um, that they can use um, and that we're building the future and in innov innovating in a way that uh, will work for them. Um, in addition to bringing that through to our developers to make sure that it benefits all of our consumers, not just enterprise. Thank you, thank you, Grace. So, um, I, I, what everybody else has said has prompted me with lots of questions. So, um, I think we're all set. But we have our first question um, from Laura, who I think this is a question probably for all of us. Um, so, I'm going to come to you in the same order in which you, you spoke. So. Have you encountered any barriers to working in STEM as a consequence of your gender? And if so, how have you overcome them? So, um, Anna, perhaps I can let's just go around in the same order. I'll come to you first, Anna. Sure. So um, I've actually been extremely fortunate in, in my working life in that um, every single one of my bosses has been male. 
um, and every one of them has been exceedingly supportive. Now that's not to say there aren't ever any obstacles or um, changes to that. So there are often times when I go into a meeting and because I am a manager rather than an engineer, uh, I'm met with an assumption that uh, I'm not necessarily going to know anything technical. Um, but in my experience, that's been relatively easy to fix. Um, and um, in some cases, it's been an asset because people explain things a lot more plainly than they might do if they assumed you knew all their acronyms and you understood everything from, from the get-go. Um, so it's, it's a mixed blessing, I think, but it's certainly not uh, been full of barriers for me. Bolajoko? Okay, so just like Anna, I've actually been fortunate to have amazing bosses who are very into supporting me in engineering and I've had to own myself, you know, make sure I had a voice, make sure no one, because yeah, there are challenges. The typical scenario, they feel like engineering is for men it's not really a women thing a woman's my onions i know my things and should be told i've worked with men i've worked with women and i personally find it much more comfortable working with men because i've been fortunate with bosses who have supported me who haven't looked down at me they've actually thrown more responsibilities to us going into meetings like anna said and people feel like you don't know anything and they do try to shut you down but i am very fearless and i'm very open when i'm speaking i let them know look i know what i'm doing and i let my work speak for itself I like that fearless. That's a that's a that's a good motto for us to us to have. Grace, how about your perspectives? Um, yeah, so I would say that there is still an issue within. Um, well, I know within tech specifically, but just having worked with the majority of large enterprise customers my entire working career is that sometimes there can be barriers, um, and sometimes there it's due to conscious bias. Uh, you know, quite often I am the only female um, on calls with customers and sometimes internally. And as somebody who has been an engineer, is now a program manager and, and titles can be deceiving about the technical nature of your role. Um, yes, I do see it. And, and with, with anything, um, it's all about being able to um, identify that. Sometimes it's really obvious bias. You know, I've had people... Uh, you know, deliberately call me out. Uh, recently, it's uh, using the terminology guys. They look at me and go, oh, sorry, not just guys. And I'm like, it's, it's okay. I do know you just mean like y'all or everyone, um, all the way up to a lot more impactful, um, you know, barriers and biases. But, you know, I think it is important that fearless aspect. Um, I, when I was very early in my career, it was hard to assert myself and often you know, you can be overlooked, not only just as a, a young person, but as a young woman. Um, it's not people's go to in a predominantly male, uh, middle aged, white industry. Um, it can be tough. Um, and unfortunately, we, you know, in Microsoft, we do a lot around diversity and inclusion. Um, I can see, unfortunately, where we are slightly more ahead compared to some of my customers, which are large enterprise um, throughout the world, unfortunately. Thank you. So um, I think I just to perhaps add a, a little bit of my own perspective. So like um, perhaps what Anna said in particular, personally, I, I think I've been very fortunate. And but there's two there's two perhaps comments I'd like to make. Not only do I feel as though I've been fortunate in the people who have been my my bosses or been um, influential. But there's been many people in those roles who have gone out of their way to support me. And I think that that's actually something more than um, just having someone who is, um, you know, perfectly not at all phased by the fact you happen to be a female in a in a, um, you know, in a, a, a gender unbalanced um, environment. So having people who, you know, who have given you that extra support to encourage you, I think is really important. And then I think the, the, the other comment I would make is that as you go through your career, particularly if you stay in that, um, this kind of environment, it becomes the norm for you. It becomes, the, it becomes almost to the point where you don't notice anymore. And I think as you go through, it's really important to keep your antennae on 
And to force yourself to look around the room and say, hang on a second, I'm the only one here, or there's only 10 of us here in a room of 100 or whatever it happens to be. And make sure that as you get more responsibility that you actually take it upon yourself to make sure that you are doing what you can either to support people um, or to make sure that it, you know, to improve the situation around you as you, uh, as you move, move on. So we've got a whole pile of questions now. Um, so, and in fact, I think the, um, I think I'd like just to do, do the, this one next. Um, Cause I, I don't, we, we don't, I don't quite know the, the range of, I know we've got 60 or so of you out there, but what stages of your careers you're at, but we've got a question here, which is, which is what I hear so often, particularly people who are uh, soon to graduate um, and perhaps people who, you know, have left university not so long ago. What advice do you have for people who feel their career still hasn't kicked off and or they still don't know what they want to do? And I'd like to add a little rider onto that is, or who are thinking of maybe wanting to change their career. Because for some of us, perhaps of my generation, the thought was you went out and, you know, that was it, you chose your career and, you know, you were fixed. And that just is not the case anymore. And it, it, it should be more the norm that we move around. So it'd be interesting to hear your perspectives on, you know, what if you, you've not quite sorted it out yet? What, what, you know, what should you do? And what about changing careers? So Anna, you're right in the middle of the kind of, I've done lots of things. <laughs> so let's go to you first. So when I heard you read out the question, I, I did chuckle a little bit because um, I'm still not sure I do know what I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and that brings me to the answer, which is say yes to lots of interesting things. Um, so the only real career advice that I've ever taken was say yes to things which seem like fun. Um, and that might be professional fun, it might be personal fun, but just try it out and, and see how it goes. Um, and it's brought me to all sorts of strange situations, most of them good. Um, I think that, you know, it's the exception when it's not good, and it just means it's too much work when it's not good. Um, but for me, it's meant that I've, I've been um, sent to interesting places across the world to represent um, universities, companies, uh, organisations in, in ways which were very unexpected. Um, when I was an, a, a postgraduate student, I went to a conference and um, started chatting to a company at their stand, at their trade stand, discovered we had mutual acquaintances, and from there developed a rapport with that company who ended up offering me a job. So it was completely unexpected, that wasn't the point of it, but I think being open to new opportunities as they present themselves to you is the biggest tip, and it's really hard to do I think at the moment, because we find ourselves in a very different situation to our usual networking setup, but it's certainly not impossible, um, it's just different. Yes, and I think I would absolutely identify with uh, be open to new things. And I think that was part of my sort of slightly glib comment at the end that I've stayed at the University of York for, you know, nearly 30 years now, but I've taken on so many different jobs. And, you know, it's being open to trying new, new, new things and taking yourself out of your comfort zone a bit and just giving things a, giving things a go. But perhaps also doing things that you think you can't do. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I would say that for most of the big jobs that I've taken on that I thought, can I really do this? But yeah, you, you, you just try it. So, um, Bola Joko, do you, would you, have you anything you'd like to uh, add to, to this or chuck into this conversation? Yes, because I finished, I graduated New York in 2014. I finished okay, my academic life in 2015. So that's roughly about five years. And I would still say to an extent, I am still conflicted because when you're in uni and yes, you're doing engineering, you expect that when you come out here, it's going to be full on being an engineer and everything's just going to be easy breezy. But then you have to face reality and look at what is actually available. I was always into in-depth engineering like I said I was in the active part I actually thought I was going to be one of those people because I did a lot of research I thought I was either going to be in the research department or I'm part of the people on field fixing things you know in the fiber sector or you know being able to say yes I'm actually doing and practicing engineering in the field but then I found myself in a managerial role and I was really conflicted because I was like okay 
or you've told yourself you're going to be an engineer you're going to be on the field you know in my mind I was going to be the one actually fixing things doing things and I'm like but now okay you're managing yes you know the technical aspect but you're managing I didn't see myself being in this position until probably like five years later on down my career and I found myself here and I have to sit back and just realize that with every opportunity you need to make the best of it I wouldn't say that now I'm 100% I can 100% I tell you that yes my career is going exactly how I planned it to be I'm still not sure of exactly what I want to be doing but one thing I'm sure of is that every opportunity that is coming my way I am making the best of it so many things that I thought I would not be able to do that you know I was it was not of interest to me it wasn't until I did them I was able to tick the box and say yes I love this yes I don't love this, you know. So you have to lose nothing by taking the opportunity and making the best of it. And then you can decide that, okay, this is not, this is not my thing. And oh, this is my thing. And you'd be very surprised that you would find out that so many things that your mind limited you because you already constructed yourself and boxed yourself that, oh, no, I don't like this. I don't like this. When you actually try it, you actually like it. So the career is something that evolves all along. You can find yourself in any sector. Where I am now, I make sure that, because I interface with a number of people who are actual engineers, who are practicing on the field, who are doing research, you know, the world, there's so many people to interface with. So I make sure I learn one or two things with them. I go meet them. I'm not afraid to learn. I'm not afraid to ask questions, you know, to just pick their brain on things. So I can know if, okay, I'm getting a more realistic oversight of things is it something I'm interested in is it something I want to know more about before I can make my decision so my answer to that like everyone has said is make the most of every opportunity that comes your way it doesn't have to be wrapped in diamond as, as you've imagined it to be the perfect way just take what other opportunity comes and you never can tell what you would gain from it at least you'll be able to decide okay no I don't like it but you'd have tried it yeah, and I think that's a really important point. It is just as valuable to find out what you don't like as well as what you do like, and you'll never know unless you, you try these things. And, and I think the other thing I, I picked up from that was I've never met anybody who has had a career that they thought was how it was going to be um, or had you know planned it and it all worked out just as they thought. It, um, life just isn't, isn't, isn't like that. Thank goodness, it's much more interesting. Grace, how about your perspectives? Yeah, I mean, you could say I've got a very happily accidental career. <laughs> so, you know, I, when I was in my final year of university, you know, I was like, right, I need to attend all these graduate fairs and, and plan my whole life now. You know, I've done the three years, I've got, I've got the letters after my name, let's do this. And I just didn't, didn't know what I wanted to do. So I did what I thought naturally we should do. You know, I applied for a nuclear grad uh, position and then I thought about it. I thought, actually, I was like, no, <laughs> I don't think I do want to do that. In fact, I don't think I'm ready to go into an office job yet. And so that's when I took the time to, you know, take the opportunity that I had uh, moving back to London, living in South East London to work at the Olympics, leading a team of people within retail as a what I would refer to now as first line workers not an information worker at all you know leading a team running around like a headless chicken trying to get stock from you know one end of the olympic park to the other and dealing with athletes and everything like that and then went traveling and then i still didn't know and then i just panicked needed a graduate job and and this it graduate consultancy fdm were offering tech training and project management training i went yeah that'll keep my parents off my back for a bit ended up moving to newcastle to work at virgin money doing the northern rock uh, kind of the, the tech merge between that and Virgin Money still didn't you know was enjoying it bits of it I weren't I wasn't enjoying and I was just kind of working on that and then wanted to move back to London so any kind of sense of plan wasn't really a plan and I would say if you do feel that your career hasn't kicked off yet that's fine because it you know some people at my age still don't think it has some people retire and are just like cool that, that was an awesome career I didn't think I even had one whilst I was doing it so I think, you know, it's back to whatever you're doing now, what parts of it do you enjoy? And you can even take away the level of the specific role. It might be traveling. It might be as crass as it sounds, you know, if it's in sales or whatever, I get paid a lot. I like having loads of money. You know, it's things like that. You just need to say, OK, well, in my next step or opportunity, I want to make sure that it has more of that and less of the stuff. I don't, And then you work on that because also there is no straight path. 
you know, people talk about squiggly careers. You know, I've gone up and down in terms of SME. I've, I've moved tech completely, gone from content management to security. You know, it's, yeah, there's, even if you have a plan, it'll probably get blown out of the water because, you know, pandemics and stuff like that happen. <laughs> Yeah, it's not often we get to say uh, we get to say that. That's really, re really great um, advice, Grace. And I just wish everyone could hear the kind of things that you're saying and um, yeah, and believe them because it yeah, it's absolutely true. Okay, now the, the next question on here, which is from an anonymous attendee, I think, is a really, really interesting one. So, um, how, if at all, does your role interact with your company's ethical, social, community goals? I find that some of this work is quite interesting, but this is tempered by the fact I am typically asked, volunteered as a token female team member in public facing projects. It's a really interesting question. And if I can take the um, uh, opportunity just to say a couple of words before I, I, I um, ask my fellow panel members, because this is something I think I, I fought against initially in the early stages of my career. You're, you're a bit scared of being the token female or you know, there's going to be a committee on gender equality therefore I will sit on it um, and you know I've known colleagues refuse invitations to say no I'm not coming I'm, I, you know, I, I will only talk on physics I will not go and talk on uh, gender equality for example and I think I've softened over the years um, um, a bit like what I was saying a little bit earlier that um, I now see it actually important really important that um, I do my best to um, to improve the environment for um, well, current generation, never mind the, the next generation. But it's then really, really important. So I think it, I think it is now important to, to take part, but to make sure that it doesn't remain a silo activity. And that's the other really important thing. To make sure that, you know, that if it is a, a gender equality thing, are there men involved as well? Um, and you know to make sure that your role in these projects is not as a token um, so yeah I think it is really important that we, we we do do our best but to make sure that it is real um, and and not a token activity which is yeah exceedingly frustrating and I have a colleague who um, has a very good answer to the being asked to to just do you know come and give a talk about an equality matter, which is, which is that she says, yes, but provided I can give a science talk as well. And, and conversely, she will often go to give a science talk and say, well, can I also do something about careers or, or about diversity? And I think that's quite a good, um, a, a good tactic because it shows that you're interested in both. And that, that uh, is quite a good example to give. So um, who wants to go first? Um, go on, Anna, off you go. Thanks, Sarah. I'm, I'm not I'm not sure I've uh, encountered this too much or perhaps I've just haven't noticed. Um, I, I think I've, I'm quite thick skinned in that uh, I often am the only woman in a particular room or I'm invited onto panels or discussions um, which um, become more gender balanced because I'm there. Um, but I've, I've sort of decided to ignore it because uh, it's an opportunity like any other. Um, and so I just take it. Um, and I think it's you can either think about it a lot and wonder what you should be doing in any given situation or just embrace it. And um, perhaps that's just in my nature. Uh, but I think if I just go for it, something will come out of it. So it might be um, that someone comes and, and tells me about um, their own experiences, which is interesting. It might be helpful to them. It might be helpful to me. It might not be. Um, it might be that. Um, from that, um, I get invited to another panel which isn't about gender uh, or which isn't uh, related to that uh, to that balance. Um, so I, I think um, I'm a little bit blasé about it in that I just ignore the idea that I could be there because I'm female and just get on with it. Yep, get on with it. Um, Bola Joko. So I've actually not paid much attention to that. And I've just always seen it, maybe because with my line manager now, I'm the only lady there. I'm the only one heading a unit. So every opportunity I find myself in, if it has to, it's not even career related anymore. In every realm of my life, if something needs to be said, I will say it. If I feel like there's an inequality with 
the women or whatever it might be, I would say, it. I would, if, if they do decide to, you know, give me certain platforms because I'm a lady and they feel like they want to make sure there's equality being done. I've, I'm very oblivious to it, to be honest, because I see it as a platform to get my message across. If I'm having meetings, like regular weekly meetings with my bosses, and we're talking about, well, my job, I'm still going to throw it in if I've heard that, oh, someone has a grievances or, or we should be doing more for the ladies or whatever it might be. So I haven't really, I, I would say I've been a bit of, a, a bit oblivious to it. I've not really, you know, really paid attention to it to tell myself, oh, are you being put in this position because you're a lady? Because I know that aside from the fact that I'm a lady, I know what I'm bringing to my table, to the table, you know, I know the intellectual bit of it. So if you choose to put me there because I'm a lady, you know, you're not just putting someone who's a lady who's not going to offer anything so I've not really paid much attention to it any opportunity I find myself in I'm going to pass the message I need to pass and obviously because of this a number of people are not so pleased with how, with how outspoken I am because they come off as oh she's a lady why should she be saying this or oh, she's young in her career like the people who are older here who have been doing a number of things why should she say this but I just turn a blind eye to it because I say whatever needs to be said. Same way they're an employee. I respect everyone. And I'm not of the opinion that because this person is a lady, this person is a man, this person is older, this person is younger. At the end of the day, what brings us together is the work. So I'm going to respect you for the work that you're doing. And I want you to respect me for the work that I'm doing. So, yeah. Great. So, um, Grace, you, you've experienced a very wide range of companies and the big and the small. So yeah, be interested to hear your perspectives on, on, on this. So in my current role, um, so Microsoft takes diversity and inclusion and equality and equity very seriously. In fact, it's in all of our, every employee's um, kind of like principal goals for the year to make sure that we're do, we've got, you know, a committed effort for d and um, And that's not something that I think is just there for the sake of it. Um, so I actively do partake in our um, women at Microsoft community. I do a lot of mentoring, both inside of the company and outside. Um, I've spoken on panels around, about tech that are aimed at just uh, women and, and people that identify as being female. Uh, you know, just before lockdown, I spoke at the Ladies of London Hacking Society, but that was purely around identity security. It just happened to be that, you know, I was there representing for the audience. Um, and I think that around tokenism and um, also, you know, tokenism can be harmful. Um, and I think it's very important that if you do feel that these things are shallow, or are just for the sake of it, that you really do ask the questions because, you know, it can get exhausting, especially if unfortunately, if your organization is small and you do happen to be the only person representing for a minority that you're being asked to represent consistently and constantly, um, you know, it's all about allyship as well. So I would say, make sure the message is genuine and that you agree and that you do see that there are actions taking place. You're not just there to talk about being a woman in tech. Uh, being the woman in tech, you're talking about the overall industry or whatever it is that you, you know, and you're interested about it. Um, and, you know, also make sure there's stuff being done above and beyond that, you know, talk about allyship training and microaggressions and, as I mentioned before, conscious and unconscious bias. Um, so that if in, even if it may feel like tokenism, you know, put your imposter syndrome to the side where you can and, and see whether if it's just, you know, you're the only one that had the opportunity and maybe bring other people with you like quite often now I get lots of opportunities I can't do them all especially when it comes to mentoring so I will refer them to other colleagues or people in my network that I know can help them who you know they may never have been able to work with before so that we can you know build that community and allyship and, and not exhaust yourself as well <laughs> yeah some really interesting perspectives there and I think there's a there's a question here which I think that um various of you particularly Grace have maybe just answered so but let me just sort of check. So Sophie was um, talking about the fact um, that she'd recently made a, a career change, applying for graduate roles. And a number of people had told her it'd be easier for her to land a role due to being female as companies want female engineers for diversity rather than on um, her own merits. What can we do to stop this kind of positive discrimination? And, and I think what you've just said about tokenism and um, it, on the one hand, just uh, grasping opportunities if they're there and from what followed Joko was saying you know 
if, if in doubt, concentrate on the work, show them that you're good and, and just, you know, let, let your work speak, speak for itself. So I think, we, I think we've, between us, I think we've addressed a lot of the points in, um, um, in that. Okay, there's a, there's a short question here, which I think is be quite interesting to hear what you, you think from Sandra. Have you ever had a man try to take credit for your work based on his gender and how did you handle it if you have? So Grace, you're chuckling. I'm gonna I'm gonna come to you first. <laughs> um, so in my role, um, because I'm empowered to make changes and get changes, you know, implemented very quickly uh, in the product, which goes globally. Um, quite often, there will be things that I'll do in the background based on one conversation with a customer that will, you know, implement huge change. And there has been, you know, recent, you know. Due to what's going on with COVID, we'd have to make a lot of changes very quickly because of the scale in which our service is under demand at the minute. And there's been a couple of my large accounts where, you know, account teams, I can just see that the message to the senior leadership within the customer is not that it came from my work. And actually, I think that's not necessarily just a problem for a man taking uh, credit. I think you know, it's important to make sure in any work that you do, it's it's visible. And that comes from allyship. Um, you know, when it does happen, when somebody very blatantly is trying to take credit for work that you've done, uh, whether it's because you've been doing it behind the scenes or against, I think it's important that, you know, you just take take a second to think, okay, wh why, why has this happened? Um, and understand, you know, is it because they just want the visibility? If it's something that's really negative in terms of it's impacting your uh, performance metrics or targets or something, then you need to be brave and and speak to either your direct line management or if it is your line manager that's a problem, then potentially talk to somebody in, in HR or your if you have an ally within the team to speak to about that, to identify whether it's consistent behavior or if they are targeting you as they feel that you may be they may have a bias towards you being female and weaker and then also prove them wrong <laughs> yeah prove them wrong that's a good one so um Anna or Bolojoko, either of you want to to add anything here I think Anna's shaking her head but uh Bolojoko, anything you want to to add about someone else I, taking I, credit for your I've... work I've heard a lot about it and I've been fortunate enough not to have experienced it before. I really don't know what I would do because it can be annoying having worked hard for something and then you don't get the acknowledgement. But I, I have great bosses who push me and put me on platforms that I shouldn't even be in, you know. So when I do something, they make sure people know that, oh, look, she did this and they take me to meetings. So if they need additional information on it, they're like, oh, she's the one that did it she can answer it so i've been fortunate not to you know have experienced that but i know a number of friends who have experienced it and they were quite sad about it they didn't know how to approach it and they just had to deal with it and they decided that they were going to you know limit the information they put out there so when it goes out there and they need someone to flesh out the idea it's still going to end up coming back to them and like you said they spoke with hr but it's not always as simple as we all think it is. Even when you speak with HR, sometimes there's still some, you know, some bias that is there, some unconscious bias. And they're like, oh, is your line manager? Like you did it for the department. It doesn't matter who gets the gratification. Like the work is being done. So I personally not experienced it before, to be honest. And I don't know what I would do should I be in the situation. Thank you. Um, and as I think uh, Grace said also, it depends a little bit whether it's a persistent behaviour or a one off and um, it can be tricky. It can be tricky and it's not always gender oriented either. Um, it, it can just be personalities. Um, OK, I'm going to ask another question now and you stay, stay there, Bola Joko, because I'm going to come to you first on, on this one. And it's a short question, but it's I think it's quite a subtle one and um, that affects us when we're in a minority. Um, so it's a question from Louise, and it says, how did you go about making connections in your industry? In other words, is that, has it been harder for you, do you think? And um, yeah, how have you gone about doing, doing that? So Bola Joko, any thoughts? Okay. Um, 
when I moved back to Nigeria, because the general ideology will most, you know, older folks in Nigeria, they feel like, well, even my dad, he didn't want me to do engineering, you know, he wanted me to do maybe medicine, pharmacy, the more, you know, approachable career, ladylike career. And when I said I was going to do engineering, he was like, no, I don't think you should do it. But I, I had to prove to him, you know, when I did my A-levels and my results came out and, you know, I'm mean, getting good grades and he's like, okay, I don't know what came over him anyway, but he just decided, like, you know what, I'm just going to let this girl do what she wants to do. So when I came back to Nigeria and I was trying to, you know, start my career, getting into the door was a bit difficult because people already, there's a bias that, oh, she's a lady, like, oh, we should be able to do the job. Like, you know, in as much as my certificates, my degrees were there, you know, having made a first class in distinction in high profile universities, some didn't even want to appreciate that. They were just more looking at, okay, she's a lady. What can she actually offer? What can she do, you know? But I had to have, like, the good thing about the whole interview process and, you know, getting a job is sometimes you're just going to have to speak one-on-one -on -one to people. And I think I had a conversation with the recruiting manager then, and he was very shocked about the things that I was saying, you know, and he got someone else in the technical team to speak with me. And I, you know, I knew what I was saying. It wasn't just about, okay, she's a lady, will she be able to do this? And I went across multiple companies. It was frustrating because I was like, oh, should I actually have just done medicine and it would have been easier to just get, you know, a job in it? Because engineering when I spoke, is already a difficult niche for ladies. So getting in would be difficult. And I really needed to prove to everyone who was against me doing engineering, look, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna work, and you're gonna see that this is what was this is what I was made for. So yeah, with minority, like minority not even being like, and that's for me being in Nigeria, because in Nigeria my race doesn't even come into, you know, into question. It's more about okay, she's a lady, like can she do this? You know, if I was in another country, probably then I would say, okay, coming from the point and me, my gender, you know, working against me. But well, in some companies that I actually went for interviews with, now, I don't know if they were just sweet talking me saying, oh, you're great. And meanwhile, they had already an unconscious bias in them saying, oh, she's a lady. Nope, she's not going to get it. But I had good conversations with them. And for me, it was just about me keeping my mental self in check and telling myself that, you know, this, this is you. No one can take it away from you, no matter how much you want to say, oh, gosh, you're a lady, you can't do this. And I found myself throughout my career well my career has been about four or five years in positions where their men were asked to do the same project and I make sure I do my best and then they're like oh Bola did this and he didn't do it until I was able to get people to know that look she's a lady great but she's an engineer she knows her stuff so you can't take that away from her so don't try and discredit her because she's a lady and this is a guy. So I've gone to meetings where guys wouldn't necessarily go to, you know, and being a lady has also been an advantage to me because having already had the mindset that my gender has been used against me, it's made me double my effort. It's made me more aggressive with getting what I want to do because I know that already it's not going to come easy. It's made me remind, remind myself that I always have to be at the top of my game. So it's been, it has its advantages and disadvantages, but I've just had to remain positive because it can't be discouraging most times when you're like, well, you shouldn't use my gender against me because if we put the CVs of what we can do without putting a face to it, you can tell that I can do this. And yeah, in a nutshell, that's about it. It's 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 had its plus and it's had. Okay, thank you. So there's lot lot lots in there about being. Do we uh, have to stay positive? Sorry, I didn't mean to speak speak over you over you. There was a delay on on, on the line. Um, so it's, there's a lot in there about being aggressive or proactive, um, and you know, re really having to you know, make a conscious effort. So. But coming back to this question about making connections and it's about networking and it's about those you know people knowing you so that you're not they're not just seeing you know the black and white of the cv that they've they've come across you which can be informal and sometimes it can be harder to break into that so grace do you have any any thoughts on on that because your yeah. industry is yeah quite a tough one i think in, yeah yeah it's um so i'm quite outgoing i'm quite sociable you know I was at university I was the live music officer of the college then the ENTS committee lead then I was ENTS at USU you know I, re I really love that 
but I really struggled with networking. I found it too awkward, forced. I was uncomfortable, especially as somebody new to the industry and new to, you know, postgraduate life. I was so uncomfortable and I really lost my shine. Um, and it took me a while to, to build that confidence back up, even to the point of starting with asking questions in meetings. I'm naturally extremely inquisitive, which is you know, why I did a degree in astrophysics in the first place. You're literally exploring the unknown. And that's come through into my career as well. So I hated networking, but it's it like I think there's statistics. It's something like 80 percent of your career impact is actually based on your network. And so I kind of try to hack networking in the sense that I would do really good work. People would want to talk about the good work and I would make sure that, uh, you know, back to taking credit for the work that you're doing is that I was presenting it. You know, it had my name all over it, sometimes quite often had my face all over it. You know, if we're talking about products that I've helped build doing YouTube tutorials, you know, even back in the day, writing articles, things like this to make sure my name and face there. And then people would talk to me. So I didn't have to awkwardly go and talk to them. Um, and then also leveraging tools such as LinkedIn uh, has been fabulous for me in terms of networking. And also within your uh, team and within your company networking, all of my jobs, apart from my initial graduate job, have actually been through my network. I actually haven't applied technically for a single job since my graduate job. And I've been through four different companies, even within Microsoft had three changes in role. And this came about through my internal network. So sometimes it's good to have, you know, go to the, the go to the events, strike up a conversation, but don't let it be too forced or awkward. That's kind of what I would say and always have something to discuss and have a reason for, for for why you're having that conversation otherwise it's you know wasted energy for everyone. That's really really interesting because you you've in a way you've found a way to network which you're actually in control of and which is more in the work space um, and it's not relied on you know the necessarily that as you say can be a little bit awkward. Just before I hand over to you Anna to see if you've got anything to, to add um, in the academic world, you know, a lot of networking is at conferences and, and the like, and I, I and a lot of the, a lot of my work has been in magnetics and the very big um, conferences are often in America, and I noticed that the Americans have a very different approach to this, um, particularly from the female perspective. They, they go all out for you know women's networking events and and at these big conferences and that feels a little weird, you know, that's the kind of thing we just don't do, but it actually works quite well. And I've been quite surprised at, you know, culturally it's very different, but they're much more open to those kinds of events. And I think all I would say is if you're in though, you know, if you have those opportunities, as Grace says, you, 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 you try them, you go for them. If you don't like them, if it doesn't work, if it is forced, then fine. But you find that even at the most awful event, you quite often will make a contact you will quite often meet just just one person and that's one more person in your private network which could be could be the winner a few a few years down the line um anna anything you want to to add into this so um i i bet like grace was also the uh, sociable student uh, but i sort of kept some of those skills to to translate straight away but not in the same way that Grace found it hard, it's a very different thing to go out to a networking event where either you're not the organiser and therefore not everyone knows you, uh, or perhaps you're not, um, you don't have exactly the, the right thing to say to the individual. So I found that for me, being really well prepared ahead of time has always been a, a real bonus. So I've either know who I'm looking for to try and find in advance. Uh, and then when I get to them, I know exactly what it is that I want to start a conversation about. Um, and this works just as well through LinkedIn as it does in, in person. Um, and I think um, at the moment, LinkedIn, don't just try and, and contact someone without having something to say or a question to ask, which you know will really help you. I think I've had a lot of approaches which are, let's connect on LinkedIn. And the answer really is if it's not adding value to me, then why? Um, and I think you should always ask that. What is it that you want from this person or what is it that they will get from you? And it doesn't have to be both ways. It can just be one way. So don't be shy about that. Um, but when you're preparing, um, whether it be for a real event or for an online um, version of the same thing, 
try to, to pull together the things which link you with other people, the things that you have in common or the, the mutual interests that you have and really play them up. People are really always keen to hear what it is that, that brings you together. They're just like you, they're also shy. Um, they're also unsure what it is that they could bring to this particular event, even if they're important, they're always pleased to have a new in with someone new. So I think that's, that's something worth remembering, whatever level you're speaking to, to someone at, um, they're just people and they are genuinely keen to make a connection with someone else. So I think there's a, a lot of fear involved in networking, a lot of fear of, um, I'm not important enough, I, I'm, I don't have anything interesting to say here, um, they're going to be bored of what I have to say, or even worse, they're just not going to know what I'm talking about. Um, but actually, it, it's fine. And, and the backup to that is just listening to what they have to say, but listening, really listening, not listening to what you think they're going to say, but listening and, and seeing it as something different that you pick up and say, well, boy, I didn't know that. People genuinely don't assume that you're stupid in these situations. If you don't know something, saying it is not an admission of defeat. Um, and I think for me personally, it took having a PhD to know that. Um, and it was something that, that I had as a badge. And it said, I have a postgraduate qualification. Of course, I'm entitled to ask a stupid question because the answer isn't obvious. Otherwise I would know it. But I don't think you should wait for that. Um, I think you have to, to be um, confident enough to know that if you're asking a question, it's because it hasn't been answered to you yet. Someone else might know the answer, but it's okay to ask. Yeah, that's a really, really good um, uh, comment. And I completely also agree with the know what it is that you want out of something, what are the questions and be prepared for these um, events. Um, and I mean, personally, I always find it much, much easier if you have some kind of role or some kind of reason why you're there. You're not, you know, it's not a social event. There may be a social aspect to it occasionally, but it's not a social event. You know, you're there for a reason, and that reason may be something that's formal because it's part of what you're doing, you're playing a role, you're representing something, or you know what it is you want to, to get out of that um, event. If you go into them thinking that it's uh, social, then it's, uh, well, it depends on your personality, but it can be, <laughs> it can be painful as we've all, we've all said. Um, okay, now we're, pr we're probably getting close to, this might be our last question, or there might be, be one more. Um, but there's quite a lot of questions here, which are all about um, either what we think should be done or what we do um, in terms of being a STEM ambassador or supporting people into, uh, into careers in STEM. So, I mean, I'm paraphrasing because there's a lot of questions in there, but if we, we can, perhaps we could all answer it how we, we want that, that's, that's relevant to us, but it's about it's about that that kind of role as being a, a, an ambassador and what we can or should do and how we we balance it with 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 other things so anna your video is still right in front of me so i'm, I'm just going to come straight back back to you to kick off and we'll go around everyone thanks sarah so um in my role uh, there are not so many opportunities to to be a stem ambassador which means i have to look for them if i if i want them um and for me, that goes down to uh, more my local environment uh, and the school that's near me uh, and chatting to the kids there um, and the, the parents also. Um, I've discovered that um, the, the supportive environment that I had at home, which said you can be whatever you want to be, isn't actually there for, for kids even today in all families. Um, and I uh, perhaps I was very shielded, but I was really surprised by that. Um, and I think whatever environment you have some um, some influence over, you just use it. Uh, and it might be at work. It might be saying, actually, wouldn't it be great to to bring in some interns to to see what it is that we do from different disciplines? Or it might be that you say, actually, my my kid's school is having a, an open day. Why don't I offer to do? Uh, a short talk or a demonstration or bring some some cool gadget into school and just get people interested and excited about it it's not just about the the flashy interesting gadgets um, but it's a good hook to get people involved in um, for, so for me it's very much grassroots and very much um, small scale but every time I have an interaction with someone it ends up turning to something scientific or turning to an interesting conversation. And the latest one was in the supermarket. And um, when, when I, I chatted to the, the lady at the cashier 
Um, and she said to me, oh, I'm not sure if I'm going overboard with my masks. I'm an engineer. I'm not working in the area of COVID-19. And I, I said to her with my serious scientist face, I said, I have many colleagues and friends who are working in this area, which is true, and they are taking this seriously. And just as an ambassador of science, she looked at me very gravely and she said, thank you, thank you, I will tell my colleagues and friends. And I thought, what place do I have here? You know, if it's any case of imposter syndrome, that was it. But actually in your everyday interactions, you have an influence that you can use. Um, you don't have to, but it feels really good to know that you can be that, that STEM ambassador in all sorts of situations. So I, I would just say go for it. Great. So, um, Grace, how about you next and then Bola Joko? I think this is going to be our last question. Um, yeah, so I think it's really important just to show up. So I think there's lots of myths, uh, preconceived ideas about what a certain position role looks like. I break that mould in pretty much in every single role. I'm usually the only person sat around a table or in a company that kind of is like me and that's because everybody's unique but traditionally there is this kind of almost cookie cutter style approach to what you think a you know a networking consultant or a software developer would look like and quite often in technology and in stem they usually look the same right so i think it's important to show up and you know be there and explain to whether it's uh you know if you're talking to your friends, explain what you do, your friends, kids, your nieces, nephews, whatever it is, you know, say, you know, I work in technology. It's cool. I don't live in a server room and unplug stuff like it's not flashing lights. I've done that at some point, but I don't do that anymore. You know, showing up and just saying that you're here and therefore you can be too helps with that because I agree with Anna, you know, quite often people don't realize that these opportunities exist or for, you know, for everybody. I also think allyship is really important. Make sure that, you know, you're only one person and, you know, there's so many uh, people out there that kind of want to, you know, promote, if we talk about women in STEM or, you know, there's many other underrepresented groups across across the world in many industries um, is allyship is, you know, how can you scale your impact, even if it's just, you know, the simple things you know, like talking to somebody saying, oh, have you realized that actually there is only X percent in our team that is, you know, of who's identified as being a woman, for example, or did you notice that actually 100 percent of our team are, have all got graduate degrees? That could also be, you know, form of allyship. Maybe we can look at early in career or doing some kind of apprenticeship team. or also the other way. Did you know that the average age of the person on our team is actually 25? What about, you know, have we looked at, you know, there's lots, lots of different things. So, showing up being a you know a figure that people could identify say right you know that's cool she does that that's awesome that's possible allyship and also yeah increasing that pipeline I do a lot of work in terms of uh, sitting on interview panels I've done lots of um, outward literally done campaigns for Microsoft to get more women premier field engineers that was just to kind of hopefully dispel the myth about you know what it takes to be a premier field engineer and even work for microsoft that can be a blocker often people think well you know i've worked in this technology for x many years but i'll never get a job in microsoft no we need the people that have been specializing for that many years don't you know we need you to get over that we want you and this you know you can do that so i think they're the key things make sure you're vocal about it, things as well and i do often challenge people when when they make certain statements about you know especially we go back to tokenism it's just challenge them and be like no not anymore get over it we're here to stay hi hello everybody. thank you so i think are we going to follow joko you've got one sentence to say something about step being a stem ambassador before kyla cuts us all off Okay, so what I do is I make sure that my life is something that people can see and they can relate with. I let them know that, look, I'm an engineer and I'm not doing bad. I'm doing great. So I speak with people, any opportunity I have, and I just use myself as a reflection to them and tell them, look, I'm in engineering. It's, it's, it's got working out well, very good for me. You know, I'm doing great. So I just encourage them that if I can do it, you can do it. And I make sure I give them whatever support they need and let them know you're just starting. You can try this, you can try that. And just let myself be an encouragement to them the same way I, may, I looked at other people and they encouraged me. So in every 
where I find myself in, I use it as an opportunity to let people look. Bala's doing engineering. She's an engineer and she's doing great. So you can do it also. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm gonna hand back to Kyla in a second. I feel we're gonna be cut off any moment. Um, but in case we, we I, I can carry on just for a second, I, I would like to thank all our panelists and uh, for such a wonderful wide range and really insightful um, answers. I know we've not quite answered all the questions, quite a few of them, I think we've answered the sense of what you've been asking, but I know there's a few we've not quite got to. And we apologize for that, but I hope that you've in, in, enjoyed the conversation. And back to you, Kyla. Thank you, thank you very much, Sarah. And thank you everyone who's been on our panel today. Um, hugely inspiring, uh, really moved by how fierce and positive you all are, actually. It's, uh, it's been really lovely to see. Um, and I'm wishing that I'd studied physics. Anyway, so <laughs> we, before we do get kicked off, I need to warn you all that we do get kicked off very abruptly. So if that happens, our apologies. But thank you to everybody who's taken part. As I said, next event is on the 10th of December, which will be around Enterprise. Do please join us for that if you're able. Look out for that invitation. Um, I feel we need another one of these events for women in STEM and that we should do it probably in the new year, definitely, I think, if the panel are up for it. If any of you are up for inspiring more of our current students and your fellow alumni, please do go to the York Profiles and Mentors web pages on the, alumni, on the university's website as well um, and provide a profile for our current students to help them see how they can get into STEM and just help them to picture what their future could look like. I thought it was absolutely fascinating. Um, sorry, I thought we'd all been kicked out there for a second. I thought it was fascinating the bit of conversation about people's journeys through their careers, whether it's accidental or intentional and those winding paths. The York Profiles and Mentors site really helps current students to explore that idea and to think about what the next step might be and to help them understand they don't have to have a plan for where they're going to be when they're, you know, 40 or 50 or 60 or wherever. They just need to know what the next thing is going to be. So I think that's it for me. Um, thank you again, everybody, for taking part and uh, hopefully see you in December. <laughs>